Welcome to the AmongArts.com video message of the week. Our message is entitled WDJD, WWJD number four, and this part is entitled The First Threat. As you probably know, this series is entitled WDJD, WWJD. We're looking at the whole life of Jesus, focusing on two things. First, we're looking at him not just as Lord and Savior, but also as example. We're stripping away all the stuff men have added to the faith over the years and just looking at Jesus straight from the Bible. We're looking at what he said and what he did that we might look at his example and live likewise, becoming real Christ followers as opposed to self-righteous people who think we're good on our own because we can find someone whose behavior is worse than ours. So the WDJD stands for What Did Jesus Do? The other side of the title is WWJD, but in this case, there's no question mark. It's not what would Jesus do. No, we're looking at this other aspect of Jesus. We're looking at the reaction of the people around him had as he was living his righteous, perfect life. We're looking to try and figure out why people could look at God incarnate and want him dead. So the WWJD stands for We Want Jesus Dead. It's looking at why people yelled crucify, why they hated and mistrusted and mistreated him so much, why he was such a big threat. I think it's important that we parallel these two things first because we want to be like Jesus and we don't want to be like the people who hated him. It's important because we don't want to become like the Pharisees who were so religious that they missed Jesus. And it's important because if we truly live like Jesus, we are going to face some opposition in this life. Some of the same stuff that he faced. Jesus was radical because his perfect life of perfectly following God, life as it was meant to be lived, was diametrically opposed to the way everyone else was living. Today, we're going to look at the first person who wanted Jesus dead. Now, I have to admit, the whole radical Jesus thing really doesn't come into play this week as much in this story. See, Jesus hasn't done much in his human form at this point in Scripture. Not much chance to upset the apple cart when you're a toddler. Yes, the first threat to Jesus' life came when he was less than two years old. Go to Matthew 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw its star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now the first thing you need to know is your nativity set is wrong. We make it seem like Jesus is born, the angels tell the shepherds, and they go to the stable, and 15 minutes later, the three wise men show up. That's not what happened, and I'll show you how I know that as we move on. Verse 3 says, King Herod, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, Where is the Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Why is Herod so disturbed? Well, it's simple, really. The Magi show up at his palace and ask where they might find the newborn king of the Jews. Now, this is a problem because as far as Herod knows, he's still king of the Jews. Nobody has told him he's been replaced and he's not really too excited about it. I mean, that'd be like having someone come to you at your job and asking where the person who is replacing you can be found. That'd be a tough day. But it gets worse. When he calls together the religious leaders, they tell him about the prophecies pertaining to the Messiah, the king that would rule forever on David's throne. Well, if that guy shows up, there'd be no need for Herod, no need for his sons. There's a new king in town, and Herod is not happy about it. Maybe we need to look a little deeper into this guy, Herod. How did he become king of the Jews? Well, it's simple, really. He was appointed by Caesar, pretty cut and dried. Caesar is emperor, and he appoints these local kings to rule over areas and groups of people. Herod probably seemed like a logical choice to Caesar. After all, Herod was part Jewish. The problem Herod has was he would never be accepted as king of the Jews by the Jews because he was not from the tribe of Judah, which was the only tribe from which a real king of the Jews could come according to God's law. Herod wasn't their choice, but they kind of had to deal with it because he's the king. He's appointed by Herod. Now, he tried to win their favor by lavishly repairing their temple. 
And it might have worked, except that he also built all kinds of pagan temples all over the place. In other words, he gave lip service to their faith, but in the end of it all, he was just another politician. He was looking out for number one, and in Herod's life, God was not number one. Herod was. Had Herod been truly motivated by his faith, love, and trust in God, the coming of the Messiah would have been great news. He would see the redemption of Israel, but all he cared about was losing his position as king. Guys, we have to remember that. Because there are things in our own lives that can come between us and God, too. We may not be kings, but each of us, if we dig deep enough, will find something in us or something we want or something that we have and want to hold on to that will take us away from God. Herod should have been overjoyed and so should have the people of Jerusalem. But instead, the scriptures say they were all disturbed. So Herod starts scheming, verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search fully for this child. And as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. There's the scheme. Have these people do my dirty work for me. Once they find him, they'll come and tell me, because they think I want to worship him too. But really, I have to preserve my position, so I'm going to nip this thing in the bud. The lesson here is really simple. You can lie to yourself about your pure heart and your pure motivations all day long, but if you find yourself conniving and scheming and sneaking around and lying, you are not doing the right thing, and something is getting between you and God. Let's take a sidebar here and look at the Magi, verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and, they, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Okay, remember when I said the nativity set is wrong? Here's your first clue. The Magi were sent to, the Be to Bethlehem to find Jesus. They followed the star, and the star led them and stopped over the place where Jesus was. And what does it say next? On coming to the house. See, Mary and Joseph and Jesus were no longer at the stable. stable. It appears that Joseph and his family had set up housekeeping in Bethlehem. It was not the same night. As a matter of fact, this, in this passage later on, it makes it pretty clear that the Magi may have traveled as much as two years. Does that mean it's wrong to have the wise men in your nativity set? No, it's not 100% accurate, but it's not wrong. While they may not have showed up until later, the gifts they, ha they gave are important to remember. Look at the rest of verse 11. When they opened their treasures, then they opened their treasures and presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, for the benefit of anyone who may not have heard this before, these gifts have two meanings. One is prophetic, one is practical. The prophetic part of it is this. The symbolism is in the gifts. Gold is a gift of, for a king. Frankincense was a type of incense used in worship. It's a gift for a god. And myrrh, myrrh is the weird one. It's the most unusual baby gift ever. Myrrh is a spice that's used to prepare dead bodies for burial. Gifts for a king, a god, and someone that is going to die. That's Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord's anointed king. The son of God and God in the flesh and the savior who came to die to take away the sins of the world. These gifts show us who Jesus is. Now the Magi were probably not kings in spite of what the song says. There were almost definitely more than three of them, and they were more than likely astrologers from another part of the world. Their interest in astrology led them to study the stars, and when they found one they'd never seen before, they followed it to the greatest king ever. Their further proof that God can use anyone as astrology is something God specifically forbids in his word. There's a pretty good chance that they walked into this story pagans, but verse 12 gives us a glimmer of hope that they changed. It says, Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. It kind of sounds like now they're obeying God, doesn't it? Now that may be me reading too much into the scriptures, but here's what I know for sure. And this is an application that we can all take into our own lives. Regardless of what motivated the wise men, God used them to further reveal his son. And God's hand of protection kept them from revealing Jesus to his first threat. When God is in something, he makes a way and his hand is upon it until his will is done. 
That's how it was for Jesus, and I believe that's how it is for anyone serving God and doing his will. That's great news for any of you who feel like God has a call on your life. You don't have to live in fear, and you don't have to live under the pressure of making sure that you're successful. All you have to do is be faithful with each day God gives you, and God will see you through. That's how the scriptures can say, He who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. No matter what your mission or call in life is, God began it and God will carry it through until it's done. Don't be afraid. God's not done with you yet. His protection is on you until his will is done. And when you are done, he takes you home to be with him forever. And if you're still breathing, you're not done. He's got good things left for you. That's good news. God's hand is on you, and God's hand was on Jesus, but a threat is coming. A threat is coming, and God's got it covered. Verse 13, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. How do you know you're outside of God's will? Well, a good sign is if you plan on killing someone, especially a baby, you're probably way off the reservation. Herod is so worried about maintaining his position that he will kill to protect it. And he's not just willing to kill either. He's willing to kill Jesus because he might be the Messiah. Herod stands on the verge of God's promise and decides to kill it so that he can keep what he has. We have got to be careful of what we value. Yes, there are some things worth defending. But how often do we step outside of God's will for our lives just to keep what we have? Didn't God give us everything? And if he decides to make us give something away or decides to take something away from us, isn't he more than capable of giving us better in return? Guys, we have got to hold on to our stuff, our positions, our titles, everything God has given very loosely, and we need to trust God more. Herod is willing to murder the one who came to be his savior, trading eternal life for a temporary position. Every person who wanted Jesus dead throughout his life was doing exactly the same thing, and so does every person who rejects his sacrifice because following Jesus might cost them something. It's so important that we get this, especially those of us who are followers of Christ. There was this missionary named Jim Elliott who was killed by the people to whom he came to minister. And he said these words, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. If you follow Jesus, everything you will keep forever is already yours forever. Be careful of what you hold on to. Herod opposed God to hold on to his position and hear this and hear it well. It was a waste. If you oppose God, I don't care if you are king, sooner or later you're going to lose. God's hand of protection was on Jesus and God remains undefeated. God told Joseph to get out of here and go to Egypt and Joseph went. Now, in case you ever think there might be a time when God is out of control, when God is not in control, consider this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, not Nazareth, where his parents actually lived, because a pagan emperor declared all the people in his empire had to go to the the town of their ancestry to be counted. I'm sure Caesar thought he ruled the world, but the prophets said centuries before Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. God had it under control. Pagan astrologers traveled hundreds or thousands of miles to offer prophetic gifts to a child born in a small town because they followed a star that just sort of mysteriously appeared. A murderous king thinks he will kill his competition, the baby of a poor carpenter and his wife, a baby born in a stable nonetheless. The poor carpenter needs to leave in the middle of the night. How will he support his family in a foreign land? Oh, wait. Did I mention those prophetic gifts brought by the pagans, who probably aren't pagans anymore, were also immensely valuable and probably could support a family for quite some time? This story shows us something we really need to get. In this world, you control nothing except possibly your own actions. Your world may look out of control, but don't you believe it. God is in control. And in case you don't believe it, look what happened next. Verse 14. 
So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Herod had a plan to oppose God, but hundreds of years earlier, God had Hosea write out these words, Out of Egypt I called my son. God is never surprised and never beaten. Trust him. Verse 16. When Herod realized that he was outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. There's that two-year timeline I mentioned earlier. Verse 17. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah. Weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Even this did not surprise God. I'm sure it broke his heart, but it didn't surprise him. Jeremiah wrote that prophecy centuries before too. Don't miss this either. When Herod saw that his plan fell apart, when he saw that his position was threatened, he decided genocide was an appropriate solution. That maybe if he killed everyone, he'd hit his target anyway. He failed because you cannot beat God. Herod was so jealous, so eager to hold on to what was his, that he would go to any length to keep it. The thing is, it wasn't his. It was given to him for a time, and in fact, he kept his throne for his entire life, and we'll soon see that he also passed it on to his son. This great act of evil proved nothing and accomplished nothing except to show hundreds of generations that Herod was an evil man. He left a legacy of hatred and pain and gained nothing. What about all those murdered children? I don't know. Why did God let that happen? I don't know that either, but here's what I do know. Why did Jesus come? Because a good God saw his beloved humanity being destroyed by their own evil, and he intervened. I know what Herod did was evil. And I know that God is good, and my guess is that at the end of Herod's rampage, God gathered those little ones to himself because God is love. Verse 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. Verse 21, so he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Why was Joseph afraid? It's pretty simple, really. Archelaus was raised by Herod. And without the intervention of God, evil generates evil. Part of the reason Jesus came was to change that. But for now, Joseph is pretty sure that the sins of the father will be visited on the next generation. Oh, but in case you think God wasn't still in control, look at the rest of verse 22. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town of Nazareth. So was fulfilled what what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. God knew this would happen too. It was all planned in advance. So why do I spend so much time in this happy season talking about such a dark story? Because works of light are usually followed by works of darkness. God brings a savior, the enemy brings genocide, and as we serve Jesus and as we follow Jesus, we too will face opposition. Herod was the first person to want Jesus dead, and as you will see over the next months, many will follow. Herod killed hundreds, maybe thousands of children to hold on to a title that wasn't even rightfully his. He saw Jesus as a threat to his way of life and tried to take him out, and he failed. Herod brought carnage but he missed his target entirely. All of the others who wanted him dead will fail too for 33 years until the appointed time. And what we will see over and over again is that God told us what would happen centuries in advance. Understand this, lots of people wanted Jesus dead and not one of them had a good reason. Oh, they had reasons, they just weren't good ones. Jesus shined light on stuff they wanted to keep in the dark. Also understand that while many wanted him dead, Jesus didn't die until everything God had set in place was fulfilled. 
Until all was fulfilled, God's hand of protection was upon him. And when it was his time to die, he laid his life down to pay the price for us. He did it of his own accord. See, this is important to us for so many reasons. It shows God's power over sin. It shows God's love for us in spite of sin. It shows his protection over us until his will is done. He is with us always to the very end of the age, just as he promised. See, Jesus shows us what to do. Jesus is a good example. Jesus laid down his life so that everyone else could receive life. Jesus sacrificed himself for the good of others. Jesus laid aside his rights for the good of others. By contrast, Herod shows us what not to do. Now, I don't see any of you watching this ever committing atrocities like he did, but I do see all of us fighting sometimes to hold on to things that we should be letting go. Je Jesus is better than Herod. What he has for us cannot be taken away, so anything he asks us to give him can be fully given, fully trusting that he is something better. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Trust him. Amen. Amen.